Well, welcome everyone to Michael Chang's uh, master's thesis defense. Uh, and I want to say thanks to Chris Duvall from Geography and Environmental Studies, who's here on Michael's committee, and Melanie Moses, who was not able to make it today, but consequently we're taping it, so she'll be able to see it. And uh, then the committee will actually reconvene on Friday. So a uh, quick introduction. Michael came to us at University of New Mexico from the University of Wisconsin. He was a student there as an undergraduate with Tim Allen, and Tim sent his highest recommendation for Michael to, to come here, and I'm glad that uh, that has happened. And over about a year and a half or so, we've been working on this project that you'll hear about today, and uh, there was some uncertainty along the way. We actually were doing real research because we didn't have 100% guarantee this would work, and it turns out it did work, so <laughs> we're happy to share that with you today. Um, so Michael is going to speak for a while, and then we'll have a question and answer period. And uh, uh, Chris, you and I will have a little discussion. And uh, I'm scheduled to be at a director's meeting at 3:30, so okay. uh, oh, put 30. some boundary on it. Well, uh, hopefully this audience will be done in an hour. Is that, is that running? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So uh, Michael Chan. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So. I'm going to tell you some cool stories about um, the stuff we've been researching on local food recently. Um, and here's an here's, here's outline of what I'm going to be uh, talking about. Uh, trends in agriculture, energy use, and opportunities for food hubs. Uh, food shed theory to sort of help out the allocation of food shed infrastructure in, uh, in food hubs. Um, diversity, scaling, and questions to address uh, related to this background in ecological theory. Uh, and we're going to center this around these two complementary views of food shed, where we take a classical approach to, um, to measuring diversity and compare and you know compare that to a hierarchical approach where we look at um, the, the the landscape as a whole and the diversity of the whole landscape um, rather than just uh, the diversity site by site. And we'll go into that uh, more and more in depth. And I'll go into a summary as to why any of this matters. Um, okay, so one issue this we're facing today is vanishing farm labor. So this is a graph from the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, it's, uh, it, it shows that over time, um, according to the USDA census, there's been this increasing percentage of the farm workforce that's above the age 65, and a decreasing percentage of the farm labor force that is between the age of 25 and 35. Um, and this is, you know, this this is global trend, and New Mexico is a part of that. And sort of overall, there have been less farmers. Um, so, for example, today we've got about one farm per 100 individuals in New Mexico, and in 1910 there were about 10 farms per 100 individuals in New Mexico. Um, and you know, is this, is this outrageous? It's like we have fewer farmers than we did 100 years ago. Now, you know, where have you heard this argument before? Um, and so in the uh, 2012 presidential debates, we had this moment with Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, and Mitt Romney's like, we have fewer ships in the Navy than we had in 1916. And Barack Obama's like, well, you know, we also have fewer horses and bayonets. And, um, you know, we've got these boats that go underwater, nuclear submarines. Um, and when he says this, you know, the game's changed. And so here's how the game's changed. Uh, for the last hundred years, we've been getting uh, increasing labor efficiency. Um, in farms. We've got mechanized labor. So, you know, there's your horses and not bayonets, but they're probably, you know, bayonets could fit into this picture anywhere. Um, the guy back there with an axe, you know, it's, it's hard work farming. Um, this guy's got a plow and all this, all this, all this labor is being done by hand, whereas, you know, here's your nuclear submarine, You've got this entire fleet of you know precision robotic tractors moving across this field and getting, you know, like, you know, hundreds of person hours of labor uh, by the implementation of fossil fuel. It's also nutrient transport. Um, you know, cows, horses, pigs, animals, poop, and then someone has to go spread across the field. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> it looks like a lot of work. This is the cover of, from a 2007 book about, um, about farming. Today, nutrient transport, you know, I mean, all these, all these different arrows are different uh, fertilizer, 
commodities being moved around. We've got, uh, we've got a lot of potash coming down from Canada, urea coming down from Ukraine to Brazil, urea going from Egypt to France, and look, they're crossing streams somewhere in the middle, watch out. Um, so, anyway, so, this is the question. Isn't having fewer farmers a good thing? Um, this is a graph from Robbie Berger, um, who I've been working with, and we've been uh, looking at the urban transition, which is this one-to-one -one line where uh, graphed, on, graphed on the y-axis is, um, is the ratio of urban to rural population. So when you're above this line, you're urbanized, and when you're below it, you're not urbanized yet. And so it looks like most countries across the world are heading towards this line and will probably pass it um, very soon. So, um, isn't having fewer farmers a good thing? You know, yeah, if we can, if we can keep up having, having efficient labor and, uh, you know, you gotta, you, if, 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 you, if you have really efficient labor, you can feed all these people that are moving into cities. But if you don't, who's gonna, who's, who's gonna feed all these, all these people in the cities? Um, so here's some, here's, here's some trends uh, since, since the Industrial Revolution. Um, on the x-axis, we've got energy inputs, y-axis, energy outputs, and you can see that sort of the transition from pre-industrial crops to industrial crops, there is an increase in output energy, in total yields, calorically, um, but also a faster increase of how much energy it took to produce those increased outputs. Um, and these are sort of mapped out, these dotted lines show declines of energy return on energy invested, where over here, you've got um, an energy return on energy invested of 10 to 1, here's a 1 to 1 line, and here for industrial livestock, we're looking at an order of magnitude less, you know, sort of, maybe there's some trophic interaction going on there, um, an order of magnitude less energy return on investment for industrial livestock. Um, and this will all have consequences that I'll, that I'll uh, talk about later. So, also, um, more recently, this is a paper from Tillman and All in Nature, um, where they talk about uh, uh, that ener energetic aspects of agricultural sustainability. And um, specifically, this graph is um, maps out nitrogen fertilizer use. The top part is global cereal yield, global, global cereal yield per hectare over time. So we're getting more out of each hectare that, that, you know, that we're growing grains on, uh, corn, wheat, whatever. Um, but here, what we're seeing is the nitrogen efficiency and the total amount of extra cereal that we're getting per the total amount of fertilizer that we're putting on it has been decreasing and is now flatlining. Um, so we're in this situation of diminishing marginal returns with our technology that we're using for, um, for this increased labor efficiency. So is increasing that labor efficiency even more the answer? Probably not. Um, because a lot of what we're doing is we're replacing, you know, we're, we're replacing contemporary energy and contemporary capacity to do work with fossil capacity to do work. Machines, chemicals, moving them around, all of that. So, just, just, just as an example, here's, you know, I think what's all, uh, another part of what's driving this trend is that farming is not an economically easy thing to do. Here's a comparison of fuel costs compared to the profit margin. So the profit margin, I'll just say, the total value of all agricultural products minus the total expenses of agriculture comes after that per farm, you know, $13,000. And uh, I've included this picture of gas prices from the 90s. Um, gas prices today are triple that. If we were to see another tripling of gas prices, um, that profit margin is getting squeezed pretty thin. Um, and what happens with that is either farmers go out of business or food prices go up. And this is the consequences of food prices going up. This is from, this is a figure from, uh, I think it was produced by some guys at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, but it looks at the FAO food price index and these spikes. And each of these red lines is an episode of political instability in North Africa. So here we've got, you know, all these Arab Spring countries, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Syria, um, you know, all in, in, this, in this 2011 food price spike. A hungry mob is an angry mob. So 
think that part of the, part of the solution for um, for 21st century agriculture is going to be making farming easier by reducing fuel inputs. So the difficulty there lies in the fact that there, 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 there are many stages in the production of food at which you can just sort of like slip in some fuel costs and you just, you know, here, there, and there's this paper by Weber and Matthews, 2008, where they look at this. And so this top, this top figure is the total distance times how much of the food is being uh, transported. And it breaks this down based on red meat, uh, sweets, fruits and vegetables, dairy products, cereals and carbs, um, based on the, the food pyramid. And, uh, and each of these different colors represents a different mode of transportation. And so when you're looking at just distance and mileage, it's pretty evenly spread out. But when you compare the bottom, which is the amount of transportation carbon costs, uh, you know, per, per each of these categories, a lot of the carbon cost is in this purple box, which is the trucks. So, the, uh, the, you know, the, tr the, the trucking and freight across roads in America is this really um, energy expensive um, and carbon expensive endeavor. And what we can see here also that I'd like to point your attention to is this clear box. So, each of these clear boxes represents the total uh, proportion of this bar that is consumed by uh, the direct cost of transportation. So directly from where it's produced to, or, or where it's processed to the consumer. So between the consumer and um, you know, the last person who handled it. Um, there's a lot of that in fruits and vegetables. And so here's, here's the United States, the red, is, is, is the most important thing here. The brown is, brown is railroad and the blue is waterways. But the, the, the weight of each of these lines on this map represents the total volume of freight moving across that. So this is, you know, this is the system that our, that, 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 that our food's embedded in. It's where all the fertilizers move. It's how all the, um, you know, it's how, it's, it's, it's how the grain moves to the cows and how the cows move to the, you know, move to the slaughterhouse and then so on and so forth. Um, and you can tell where all the cities are, right? You're at the convergences of all of these, uh, you know, all of these very blood vessel-y looking um, kind of things. So, so here's where hubs come in. Hubs allow you to localize the flows of food and resources to produce food. So what's a food hub? So according to the USDA, a food hub is any business or organization that um, you know that sort of you know, like the like this like the spokes in a wheel aggregates local food and then read it, you know distributes it so it focuses all this diffuse supply on concentrated demand um, and does so does so does so locally and it can be a number of things so what we're concerned with is physical hubs and so you know two main kinds of physical hubs I, we're, we're we're primarily concerned with distribution warehouses but it could also be a farm where people come to and there's, you know, it's this community space and uh, distribution warehouse is cool because you can, you know, you can, you, can, you can have all these refrigerators there, processing equipment, packaging equipment, scales, all of this capital for small producers to share and reduce costs. Um, and for me as a biologist, this is why local food infrastructure matters to me. Because, it's, because of this, uh, this paper by Kloppenberg in 1996 um, where it talks about the food shed is being this unity of place and people of nature and society. And it's about trying to figure out ways to produce food that, um, you know, that minimizes impacts on the environment and, you know, sort of this, the, 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 externalization, the externalization of costs on, um, you know, on the, on the on society, economically, energetically, all of that. And so this is Will Allen in Milwaukee. And uh, they're, he's, at, he's at Growing Power, which is, a, which is a type of food hub, and they grow, they grow a lot of perch aquaponically in, in, in the inner cities of Milwaukee. Um, look, at how, look at how happy everyone is. <laughs> um, so here's regionalizing the food system. Um, so this is from, a, this is, this is from an MIT uh, Urban Design Lab presentation by uh, Kennard and Ackerman, where they looked at where all these farms are in these black dots and then did the same thing that the Department of Transportation did for all freight in the US, except they were like, okay, so how much food is gonna move around? 
So to me, I see something dramatically different between these two, you know, these, these two network configurations, where you've got this one over here that's explosive and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's energetically like just souped up and it almost, you know, it looks like blood vessels around a tumor, and here it looks like, you know, it looks like a lung. Um, <coughs> and so here's all, here's, here's all the cropland um, in the green. And so, anyways, that's that's what one food shed, well, uh, what one food shed looks like. So. What we're thinking is, where do you put hubs? So hubs are this growing trend. Um, this is from the USDA, and um, of the 200 food hubs that currently exist, um, most of them have showed up within the last decade, and uh, roughly half of them are economically viable right now. So that presents a challenge and an opportunity to figure out some theory based on landscape uh, to um, to designate locations for food hub infrastructure. Um, and you notice that, that, that most of these hubs are centered in, in urban areas, Oklahoma City, Albuquerque, Phoenix, um, Dallas. So how do you put a hub on a landscape out close to the farmers? So here are the, so here are the issues that, that, that the food shed theory, I think, can help address. And I'm going to present that. So we've got the few supply and centralized demand, high economic uncertainty on behalf of producers for, for you know small um, small small producers. You uh, it's, it's it's hard to find demand, um, and then uh, even if you can't find demand, often often externalized costs by large scale production can make competition difficult. Um, so here are the questions that I'm going to try to answer. Um, does a food shed exhibit statistical regularities? Such as you know, such as those in a watershed. We're gonna ask questions of scale. So how big how big should a hub be? You know, if if you're gonna try and throw a net onto the landscape to to collect um, you know an inventory of production, how big should that net be? What should you be trying to go for? Um, and if there if if there are agents on the landscape, distributors who are seeking to try to um, you know aggregate the supply, what implications does this have for growers? Location, where should the hub be located? And then, um, what are the types of foods that the hub should serve? So first, we're gonna look at what are the statistical regularities underlying the food shed. So the inspiration for this project comes out of uh, the work of Dunn et al, 2011, um, that looked at 13,000 streams in, uh, in a watershed in Kansas. And um, the way that you take inventory of a watershed is you use Horton orders. So Horton order, which we're going to designate by a little omega letter, um, refers to the, the position the position in the hierarchy, both um, in terms of how it's connected to the other parts, but also in terms of how it, um, uh, like just other, other, other hydrological properties. So here we've got, you know, a first order means a first order, makes a second order, second order meets a second order, makes a third order. Um, and as you, you know, go down this, they have seven orders of streams in this study. Um, and moving downstream in the network is going to have scaling consequences for various hydraulic variables. Um, so these open circles are the number of streams. So as you're moving downstream, you get, you get, uh, you get fewer streams of a given order. These, uh, these pluses here are basin area per stream and then stream length. So as you're moving downstream, also your streams are getting longer, and the total collection area for each of those streams is also getting bigger. And so we use this by analogy in the food set. It's like as you, you, know, as you, as you move downstream, you have a larger and larger basin that you're considering for the collection of food. You know, and downstream is also moving upscale. And so this is the fundamental question that we're trying to ask. And um, I'd like to pause to see if there are any questions, because this is, are we, we good? This is, this, is the, this is the atom of it. OK, so, so the way we went about this was uh, by pitting two hypotheses against each other, one that was classical and one that was hierarchical, where um, I'll get to the hierarchical later. But first, um, we're going to ask, what does the diversity look like? Um, and so, here's where we got the data. 
the National Agricultural Statistics Service has this thing called the Cropland Data Layer, and it's got 30 meter pixels for you know all of the land cover in the conservative United States. Um, so you grab a grab, grab, grab a square from within New Mexico, and you'll see why it's a square in a bit, because we had to take that square and split it up into squares. So just like in the Hortonian hierarchy, where as you're moving downstream, you're increasing your basin area, um, we sort of set up this, uh, this division of squares hierarchically so that as you're moving downstream in the food shed hierarchy, you also experience um, you know, greater diversity uh, and sort of the, like the scale of observation is what changes um, as you move. So, trying to figure out if these have some analogies. So this is the information that was available in CDL. So you had 40 different crop types. So we could have you know, a number of species. We got a spe you know, species majors. We got all these different sites. And so these sites were, um, you know, say if we're looking at, uh, we're looking at order 12, per se, and we split it up twice. Now we have, uh, you know, there, there, there are 16 different squares to look at in which to count all of the, um, all the total areas of those crops. And so across the entire study area, there is uh, you know, a, 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 a range of, um, you know, a, a, just a total area that we're looking at. And that's important, um, and I'll get to that later, because it's, it, it becomes this baseline from which to sort of compare things in the, in the hierarchical perspective. Um, and so then, that's, that's how we found cells. So in order to make this, make this manageable by the computer, we had to summarize it. So this is for winter wheat. Winter wheat is this brown stuff. And uh, here we've got summary pixels where how light these sort of larger blocks are represents the total density of winter wheat in that 64 by 64 like block pixel. Um, and so you can see here, like this one's got a lot, this one's got less and less, even less here. Um, and so once we've done that, we can compile the inventories for all the crops. And this is where everything was. This also included grasslands, because there's a lot of there's a lot of range in New Mexico. Um, a lot of a lot of you know a lot of cattle out there. And there, you know, they'll go out and they'll graze all this. This is, this is, this is mostly grassland. Um, and what this shows is on this, on this heat scale, the, the total number of agricultural pixels per 64 by 64 block. And so you can see where all of the, um, all the farmland is. And so we split that up into, you know, across these, across these orders of observation. Um, and we had a total of 14 orders. So order 14 is the scale of the entire study area. And then as you move upstream, you're looking at progressively um, sort of decimated uh, sets of, 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 of blocks. So here we lo here's, here's a log transform for, for clarity of, of uh, you know, where, where all of these uh, agricultural pixels are. And you can see that over here, you know, a lot of the a lot of the edible crops are along along the Rio Grande, and uh, and then also a lot of this irrigated area out here. Um, so we split it into edible and forage, on the basis of how quickly does it enter the food chain. Um, when we're when we're you know when we're considering, you know, setting up infrastructure, <coughs> you know, you don't want to you don't want to be bringing in, hey, here's your alfalfa and here's your apples, and we're gonna just send it to the grocery store. It's like you don't get alfalfa at the grocery store. Um, so we had to we had to we had to we had to make some make some distinctions here. Um, and then so forage crops were those that entered the human food supply chain um, by animals. So grassland, pasture, corn, alfalfa, um, and other things. Okay, so this is just a this is a, this is a this is a community analysis, and um, we so we did a we did a multi-scale um, hierarchical principal component analysis of the crop diversity. So um, so basically, the height of each of these bars represents the similarity of that sector of that scale order to to the whole study area, and. The x, and, the x and y axes here are space. This direction is north. This direction is north to you. This direction is north. 
and um, and the and the and the z-axis is the PCA score of the first axis. And the first axis for all three of these PCAs were basically dominated by grassland, winter wheat, and fallow and idle um, crop occupancy, uh, occupancy pixels. And so those, uh, you know, basically determine what was going on. And so really, these these bar scores are a measure of like how much winter wheat is there and all this other stuff for that. And what's cool here is actually sort of the hierarchical clustering of uh, PCA axis one scores within um, you know, sort of with, within each upstream scale order. So, anyways, back to this, back to testing this hypothesis of the hierarchical versus the classical approach. Um, so, we wanted to see if anything could reveal some diversity scaling laws. So, what's this hierarchical approach thing? So, the hierarchical approach has to do with um, looking at each of these different. Uh, each, each of these subsets of the whole system in relation to the whole system rather than in relation to themselves. So, uh, first, in order to, in order to uh, understand this, I want to go over um, the, the, the diversity index we use, which is, which is the Shannon index. And um, we use this because it was, it's been shown by um, uh, Joss et al. 2006 and uh, Hill 1973 that um, the Shannon diversity index is actually a, um, it's a sort of, it, it's, it, it's an index from which all other diversity indices can be derived. Um, and it's a measure of evenness, also uncertainty. So here, where we've got four separate species in, in, in this community, say, if you were to grab one of those species at random, you have much lower uncertainty as to what species you're going to get in this situation as opposed to this situation. Because in this situation, you're actually, you, you, you already know that you're more likely to get species A or E if you're to select any, you know, if I were to select a pixel at random from within a block. Versus here, where you have a high diversity and high uncertainty, and there's, there, there is a more, I guess, equal probability that you're going to um, select any one of these four species out of um, you know this this configuration of abundances. So here's you know here's here's the lowest diversity value possible monoculture where there is absolute certainty that you know if you're gonna pick a pixel it's like yeah well, it's definitely corn. Um, so here's how the classical kind of system works. We've got we've got the total number of species, we've got the total area of all crops, we've got the total number of um, of sites, and so. It's an issue of where the probabilities come from. So, in this classical approach, you make sure that all the probabilities of getting crop type A, B, C, all of them, they all add up to one across the sites. So, then to get um, to get an entry, you know, to get a diversity index of that site, you then add up all of the probabilities times the natural log of those probabilities. So the difference here is. In a hierarchical approach, you um, you don't necessarily need all the probabilities to add up to one at an individual site. What's most important is that all the probabilities sum to one across the entire area. So there's an area of pixels occupied by um, species A here, A here, A here, A here, uh, C here, B here, B here. All of those need to add up to one rather than um, just adding up to one in a single site. So then we did this for you know, each order all the way down to um, order seven. All the way upstream to order seven, so to say. And so